All right. Okay. So uh, just we're waiting for people to get in. You're starting your launch. Uh, I want to have this pressure to introduce my guest, uh, Dr. Raj Mahatran, who I have known for many years, and uh, he's been doing wonderful in the area of cardiovascular research, in particular in the area of calcification, which you probably all know is my favorite topic uh, in the world. Anyway, uh, this is not the only thing he does. He does a lot of research. His research kind of spans many aspects related to the cardiovascular system. So you, today's talk will focus on calcification, and that's related to his uh, training and his practicing in uh, cardiovascular medicine. And Raj actually graduated. His, I just noticed he's a long time Harvard <laughs> person. He must love it so much. He did his undergraduate there, graduate student there, uh, and then medical uh, school there. And he never left, right? Well, he, my uh, wife. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and with all that, he uh, rose the rank uh, from uh, instructor to assistant professor and soon be associate professor. Uh, so he is a cardiologist in the Mass General and also a physician scientist. You will hear a lot of uh, wonderful research uh, today. And what I'm impressed most is he can kind of integrate what he learned in the bedside and go put into the lab uh, to understand the mechanism and use that to get a guide back to uh, his practice. So I think that's what we all always want to do, especially for our department uh, pathology. We want to understand the mechanism of the disease. And also we want to know how the knowledge we learned in the lab can apply to, the, uh, to either diagnostic or treatment. And with that uh, kind of knowledge, and Raj has been published well and very well recognized in the field. And as a matter of fact, his recently, he has quite a few papers uh, in high profile journals. And I noticed in Nature Genetics, Nature Cardiovascular, and uh, all the circulation, circuit research, all, all those uh, very high impressive. And in addition to that, he currently holds two active hour ones. And that was really impressive for a young physician scientist who has been doing so well in, in, in the very short period of time. In also, not only his research, he does a lot of service and training as well to his fellows. He's currently co-directing the uh, cardiovascular fellowship program and the co-director of the, uh, what's the, the cardiomyopathy, cardi yeah, ICU units and all those. It is it, unbelievable how he can manage all his time. But that's what I would also advise our pathologists. If you really want to know what you're doing, if you were really into research, so that's possible you can manage them, but that involves a lot of work. But anyway, and I really appreciate what, what are you doing and uh, your wonderful research. And that's why I want you to share with us and especially our young physician scientists, uh, how the path can, your, your kind of research and the clinical path and, and also how our fellows can get advice from him. Uh, what are you looking for for academic medicine? So without further ado, I'll let you lead the podium. Thank you so Thank much, you. Yaving. And but thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It means a lot to me, especially given that you're one of the leaders and pioneers in vascular calcification research, and have served a role model for me for many years. Um, and I want to thank you all for welcoming here me here at QAB. Um, it's been such a pleasure meeting and talking to many of you yesterday and this morning, and I look forward to meeting some of you later this afternoon. Uh, as Yavik mentioned, I'm going to talk about some of the work that my laboratory has been doing on identifying novel molecular and genetic 
regulators of vascular calcification and atherosclerosis. Um, these are just some disclosures. Um, but this is just the outline of my talk. Um, keep it, I'll keep it informal. If anyone wants to ask any questions in the middle, please feel free to. I'll talk about the clinical importance of vascular calcification from a patient perspective. Then I'll highlight a few of the stories, the research stories that um, my laboratory has been focusing on. One, one is of an interesting protein called matrix GLA protein, um, the histone deacetylase pathway. I'll briefly introduce the sulfatases and their role in vascular calcification, but I don't have time to um, go over um, much of the um, newer findings that we've had in this setting. And then I'll talk to you and introduce to you uh, about a clinical entity called calciphylaxis, which is a form of accelerated vascular calcification that we hope to identify novel therapy for. Um, and I'll go over some of the research we've been doing in this arena. But um, I'll start off by saying that you know when I'm rounding in the ICU or seeing patients um, in clinic, you know we often are confronted with patients who have a significant amount of arterial calcification. This was someone I saw in the ICU about six months ago, um, 73 year old woman, former smoker. Um, she presented with an acute myocardial infarction and she reported only mild symptoms of peripheral arterial disease. But, um, but, uh, um, but when you look at her CT scan, you can see that her aorta, as well as her peripheral arterial vessels, um, have significant ring-like uh, uh, engulfment of their, of their arteries. And this made it very difficult to actually treat her myocardial infarction because how could we access the coronaries if we can't go through the ephemerals acutely? And she actually had occlusion of one of her subclavians and a radial. So we actually had to go brachial artery uh, access to even gain access to her coronaries and, and to provide her the therapy that she needed. So this is not an uncommon problem. And, um, and so I became very interested in vascular calcification when I've you know, been inspired by many of these patients that I've seen. Um, as you know, atherocalcific vascular disease is the largest cause of morbid morbidity and mortality globally. And the presence of vascular calcification serves as a strong independent predictor for cardiovascular disease events. Yet no directed therapies for calcification exist. And this is just one of many studies that I can cite looking at the increased mortality that patients have with increasing vascular calcification. So with different arterial beds, and I think here they looked at coronary, carotid, uh, tibial, and, um, and aortic. For every arterial bed that's affected by calcification, your mortality significantly increases. And this, these curves, curves are separating very early on at the start of the study. So within a year of diagnosing the presence of arterial calcification, you already start seeing events um, and um, effects on mortality. So how does vascular calcification predict cardiovascular events compared to other risk factors? And what we see here was this nice study published in circulation a couple of decades ago um, from the Friendly and Heart Study, really looking at how different coronary calcium scores based on CT imaging can impact uh, long-term um, event rates for cardiovascular disease. And you can see as your coronary calcium score increases, there's a high amount of um, risk that increases for cardiovascular disease. Now, how does this compare to your traditional risk factors such as obesity, age, hyperlipidemia? When you encompass those traditional risk factors into the Framingham risk score, the 10-year risk calculator, you can still see that even stratifying by Framingham risk, the addition of coronary calcium score further risk stratifies patient populations with those with higher coronary calcium exhibiting higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, when we talk about cardiovascular calcification, there's really two types of cardiovascular calcification. There's your typical atherosclerotic calcification or intimal calcification that affects the luminal surface area of the vessel. Um, and this is associated with hyperlipidemia, macrophage um, inflammation, um, and oxidized LDL particles that infiltrate the vessel wall. And and is commonly associated with diseases such as myocardial infarction, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, and vascular disease. But there's also non-inflammatory medial vessel calcification that can occur in the medial vessel where the calcium lays down along the elastin fibers of the wall and cause, results in elastin fragmentation and loss of 
arterial elasticity, or as we call it, increased arterial stiffness. And this medial vessel calcification is associated with chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypotensive heart disease, and HEPREP, or a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's also associated with the, the accelerated form of vascular calcification known as calciphylaxis that I'll be talking about a little bit later today. Now, Renu Vermani has done some really um, exciting and pivotal work on looking at plaque rupture in the context of myocardial infarction and has identified some significant um, findings for calcification um, in the context of plaque rupture. And what she's observed is that when you're looking at more acute, unstable plaques, or those that have undergone plaque rupture, you tend to find speckled forms of calcification or microcalcification, whereas maybe the diffuse calcification that sometimes we see in the coronaries isn't as um, uh, associated with plaque rupture or plaque instability. And I think that makes sense from a physics perspective, because it's really at the interface of the high-density calcium and the low density lipoproteins and the lipids, where you can get most uh, strain or stress, um, and that can be uh, set up for uh, plaque rupture. And this phenomenon or ideology was um, further supported by many papers, including this one, which showed that in the context of microcalcification, you get increased amount of stress for a given amount of strain um, for, uh, for a given size vessel. So clearly, my, the presence of microcalcification one is a strong and calcification is a strong independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease events, and pathologically, it seems to make sense that uh, the microcalcification contributes to plaque instability and rupture. So, how do we study calcification in the lab? Um, yeah, Ding is an expert in this, but I'll just review for everyone that there are the models of inflammatory vascular calcification as well as medial calcification, which we commonly use in the laboratory. LDLR knockout and APOE knockout mice on high fat diets, uh, model the atherosclerotic calcification. I'll talk about matrix GLA protein, but this deficiency of this gene, MGP, is a model for medial vessel calcification, as well as models of diabetes in mice and chronic kidney disease. So, what is matrix GLA protein or MGP? MGP is one of the strongest endogenous inhibitors of vascular calcification, it's protective. It's only 84 amino acids long. It, it looks very similar in structure to parathyroid hormone. And interestingly, there are five glutamic acid residues along this structure that provide the, acti the activity of matrix GLA protein. Uh, these five glutamic acid residues become gamma carboxylated. And that gamma carboxylation is required for the protective effect of MGP against vascular calcification. So how do these glutamic acid residues get gamma carboxylated? Well, it requires a gamma, it's hard to pronounce, but a gamma carboxyglutamase enzyme that is vitamin K dependent. So vitamin K is required for the activity and function of MGP. Without vitamin K, you have inactive MGP and you're more prone to develop vascular calcification. Well, interestingly, in the clinical side, we used to give very commonly a blood thinner known as Coumadin or Warfarin to our patients with mechanical valves or with atrial fibrillation. And the way this uh, drug works is by inhibiting the cycling of vitamin K in the body. So actually, this um, blood thinner, Warfarin, has been associated with greater quantity and faster acceleration or progression of vascular calcification in humans. Fortunately, we now have many other options for blood thinners um, for our patients that we rarely use Coumadin anymore, but that's something that we have to be cognizant of, is that patients on Coumadin are at increased risk for vascular calcification. Now, how does the MGP work? Well, glutamic acid residues directly, it's a, it's a secreted protein, about 10 kilodaltons, and the gl um, carboxylated gl um, glutamic acid re residues bind directly to the calcium phosphate and hydroxyapatite and prevent the extension of these extracellular calcification crystals in the, um, in the extracellular space. Furthermore, um, in elegant work uh, done by Christina Bostrom, MGP has been shown to inhibit directly BMP ligands, bone morphogenic protein ligands, and these BMP ligands, when they signal uh, on smooth muscle cells, directly promote the transition of these smooth muscle cells to a more bone-like state and can cause calcification. So MGP actually has two uh, basic biologic functions in its role in inhibiting calcification. 
There are lots of function mutations that have been identified in humans that result in something known as cutal syndrome. Interestingly, these uh, patients don't develop diffuse vascular calcification like the mouse model does, but they do de uh, de develop calcification of uh, soft tissue space, and they also um, develop pulmonary arterial stenosis. So perhaps, um, unlike the mouse model, which I'll get to in a moment, in, the, in humans with loss of function of NDP, there might be some other protein that might be compensating for the loss of energy. Sorry, question. Yes. What, uh, what the cellular source of uh, cellular source of serum MGP? Uh, that's a great question. That's a really good question. So MGP is expressed diffusely, but primarily by cartilage, mm -hmm. vascular tissue muscle cells, and endothelial cells. Those are the three cell types that express it the most. But there's been work done by um, who's the guy from New York, the bone biologist, uh, Carsenti, Gerard Carsenti, that show that um, circulating MGP is not protective alone. You really need to get it into the tissues. So it's the tissue source that, so if you, if you were to just create a transgene in the liver that overexpressed MGP, that would not be sufficient to prevent vascular calcification. You really need the MGP to be synthesized at the source in the vasculature. So from a common disease perspective, there are polymorphisms that have been identified in the MGP locus that are associated with different functions and levels of MGP. And these polymorphisms are associated with cardiovascular disease, coronary artery calcification, and the progression of coronary artery calcification. So studying MGP is not just relevant for this rare disease of Cutal syndrome. It is also relevant for more common forms of cardiovascular disease. And in the knockout mouse model, which we study quite a bit in our laboratory, you can see that by two weeks of age, these MGP-deficient mice develop diffuse arterial calcification as evidenced by this allozarin red stain, or we also, also use von Kossa stains for detecting uh, aortic calcification. It becomes so brittle, the aorta, with all this dense calcification that it's like a bone. And by five to six weeks of age, the aorta ruptures uh, or fractures like a bone, and the mice die. So before I get into calcification, I want, just wanted to let you know about a, a quick story that, um, that me and uh, some other cardio, uh, cardiology physician scientists uh, at MGH worked on, where we identified that the MGP uh, homozygous knockouts develop vascular calcification, but there's no calcification that develops in the MGP heterozygote mice. But what we did identify was that these MGP heterozygote mice develop arterial stiffness. And so I think the theme of this story, this work and work by other people, including Phil Sal, has identified that the same pathways that contribute to calcification can also contribute to arterial stiffness. And, um, and so what we identified is that in MGP heterozygote mice, uh, particularly female mice, there was increased uh, pulse wave velocity of the aortas um, as measured by echocardiography. And this is a direct surrogate for arterial stiffness. Um, we also found the same thing when we did an MRI-based measure of arterial stiffness um, in mice. Furthermore, you would imagine that with chronic arterial stiffness, this would increase loading of the, um, of the left ventricle and, and potentially contribute to hypertrophic stimuli in a, in a pressure overload system. Um, this would be evidenced by increased fibrosis of the left ventricle, and that's exactly what we saw that in these T1-weighted MRI images of the um, MGP heterozygote mice versus wild type mice, we saw increased fibrosis. This providing evidence that the MGP heterozygous uh, model is a model of arterial stiffness and um, potentially left ventricular remodeling that can contribute to the development of hep cell. Now we went a step further and said, okay, well, this is in a mouse model. What about it in humans? Um, and before I get to the human data, I'll just show the histology. But interestingly, in these MGP heterozygote mice, you do see increased collagen deposition in the arterial walls. With, reduce, um, with worsening elastin fragmentation, as well as uh, endosuminal fluorescent stain showing increased collagen one in the expression of the MGP heterozygous mice. So the MGP heterozygous mice seem to be a good model for arterial stiffness. What about in humans? So this is where we went to um, our colleagues at the Framingham Heart Study, and in 7,000 humans, um, we measured circulating MGP levels. And what we found was that, as we predicted, MGP levels were associated with uh, the development of left ventricular fibrosis and increased strain on echocardiography. And as seen in this table here, the downstream consequences of that were an increased rate of incident hypertension, as well as increased incident HEF-PEF, um, but not HEF-REF when you did it in, uh, when you looked at it in multivariate modeling. 
So this would suggest that MGP seems to be potentially a therapeutic target in the context of human arterial stiffness and potentially left ventricular remodeling and heft test. So this was just a, a quick story to look at MGP heterozygosity in the mouse model and, and the relevance in human disease. Um, but let's go back to the homozygous uh, knockout condition. And you can see here, um, you know, just uh, from an from a experimental perspective, we use in our lab, we tend to use fluorescent probes in our animal models to quantify the degree of aortic calcification and aortic inflammation. These probes are called osteosense and prosense. Osteosense is a bisphosphonate probe that binds directly to the calcium phosphate crystals, and once it binds, releases the fluorescent signature. And uh, this prosense probe tends to be specific for macrophage activity. It has to be cleaved by a capepsin K enzyme in order to um, uh, express its uh, um, fluorescent signal. And capepsin K, in the vasculature at least, tends to be more expressed in macrophages than any other cell type. So it tends to, it's, it's used as a surrogate marker for macrophage inflammation. So you can see in the wild type mice, there's no calcification and there's no um, inflammation. This is just background. And for the longest time, it was thought that in order to get vascular calcification, you needed inflammation. But that was true in atherosclerotic models, like the LDLR knockout mouse model, where the degree of calcification and the localization definitely uh, overlapped with the degree of inflammation. But you can see that in this uh, MGP knockout mouse model of medial calcification, there's calcification in the absence of inflammation. And that bears true in human disease as well. Rainy Vermani, again, who's done a lot of the pathologic assessment of vascular disease, has shown that medial calcification can occur in the absence of inflammatory uh, infiltrates of the vessel wall. So we use both calcification, uh, osteosense and prosense as readouts in our experimental setup. And, um, and for in vivo setups. And then for in vitro, really, you know, there are a lot of cell types in the vessel wall that contribute to the development of calcification, but at the heart of it is the vascular smooth muscle cell, um, which is what our lab focuses on studying. And under, um, you know, normally the vascular smooth muscle cell is highly contractile and expresses contractile proteins like SM22 and smooth muscle actin, but under different states of stress, whether it's oxidant stress or inflammatory stress or you know, reduced autophagy, these cells will transdifferentiate or switch their phenotype from a contractile smooth muscle cell to a bone-like cell. Start expressing markers of bone like RUNX2 and alkaline phosphatase, and actually RUNX2, which, you know, again, Yabing has been a pioneer in studying um, in the context of vascular calcification. RUNX2 is the master transcriptional regulator that um, signals for the smooth muscle cell to transition to an osteogenic state. Once it's in this osteogenic state, you see that these cells are highly proliferative and less contractile. They migrate more, and they lay down calcium um, in the extracellular matrix. So we use the vascular smooth muscle cell as a model for vascular calcification in our lab. And we've been very interested in identifying novel mediators of vascular calcification. So we were, you know, being a clinician, I was very interested in the underlying genetics of cardiovascular calcification. Um, you know, when I was uh, in the middle of my fellowship, um, I had realized that, you know, a lot had been done to study the genetics of coronary artery calcification, mitral valve calcification, and aortic valve calcification with these loci being identified, but nothing had been studied in the context of aortic calcification. So um, I took to uh, uh, my colleagues at the Framingham Heart Study and other consortia um, throughout the world and um, aortic calcification actually is a strong independent risk factor for both coronary events and stroke. And uh, um, we were interested in performing the first genome-wide association study for aortic calcification. And so we uh, combined data from five different cohorts representing over 9,000 participants, all of whom had undergone multi-detector CT scanning to quantify the calcium for um, uh, the aortic calcium for each of these patients. And this is the results of our GWAS, um, and we identified two loci, one on chromosome seven at the HDAC9 CRISP1 locus, and another one on chromosome one at the RAP1 GTP8 activating protein locus that met genome-wide levels of significance for association with aortic calcification. Um, back in those days, uh, GWASs were done primarily in Caucasian cohorts, and then replication was performed in non-Caucasian ethnicities. So when we did the replication analyses, um, the, the locus on chromosome one, one did not meet statistical significance, 
but uh, we did, um, there was strong statistical significance for uh, the locus on chromosome seven. We can then look to see what those variants are doing. This is called sort of SNP to function assessment or evaluation. And one way of doing this is to see what those variants or those polymorphisms that met genome-wide significance, how they associate with gene expression of the neighboring genes at the mRNA level. And we found that the variants that were associated with both, uh, you know, at the genome-wide level on chromosome seven were um, associated with expression of both HDAC9 and TWIX1. Furthermore, we looked at other phenotypes besides aortic calcification and found that these same variants were also associated with coronary artery calcification, carotid plaque, and CEV events. So we're very excited about this because one, uh, you know, there's a lot of differences in the biology between the different arterial beds, carotid, aorta, coronaries, but this seemed to be a locus that was consistent across multiple vascular beds. And two, we, you know, we, we were interested in diving at the mechanism of this. We weren't sure which gene to focus on first because these variants, like I said, seem to regulate both genes, HDAC9 on one side and twist one on the other. You can see that the variants that were associated with this GWAS are in this intergenic locus. So um, we did some standard expre gene expression analysis in smooth muscle cells. We didn't see much twist one expression in smooth muscle cells but there was a ton of HDAC9 expression. So we focused our efforts on HDAC9, and I'll tell you about the HDAC9 story now. I will tell you this though, Dan Rader, uh, group at Penn, have uh, some nice uh, biology that they've identified of twist one in epithelial cells also, um, and smooth muscle cells also regulating vascular calcification. But our lab focused on HDAC9, and you know we just did some simple experiments in the lab where we um, inhibited HDAC9 with a small molecule, and you can see here that when you inhibit uh, HDAC9 with a small molecule, you get a reduction in RUNX2 expression in these smooth muscle cells. Remember, RUNX2 is that transcription factor that regulates the transition to bone-like states. You can also see that in the context of the HDAC9 inhibitor, um, you get a significant reduction in the calcification of these human vascular smooth muscle cells. When we overexpress HDAC9 with an adenovirus, we get uh, the opposite results. We get an induction of RUNX2 expression and it increases the calcification of the smooth muscle cells. Um, remember from this uh, model of the, of the in vitro uh, um, modeling of vascular uh, calcification, you remember that there's a phenotype switch. So when you're in the bone-like or osteoblast-like state, you have increased proliferation and reduced contractility. If you inhibit this transition to the bone-like state, you should see the opposite. You should see reduced proliferation and increased contractility. And that's exactly what we saw. When we inhibited HDAC9, we saw reduced proliferation and then increased co contractility. I'll just spend a second to, um, you know, to, for some of the trainees in the audience to describe this assay here, but it's a, it's a really nice assay. It's a collagen gel contraction assay. And um, what you do is you grow smooth muscle cells in a collagen suspension and let the collagen solidify. Um, then you release the collagen with the live cells on the inside uh, you release the collagen from the edges of the wells, and the amount of contraction of the collagen is proportional to the cell contractility within it. So we like to use this as a, as a measure of uh, vascular smooth muscle cell contractility. And you can see here that when you inhibit HDAC9, so you inhibit that osteogenic transformation, you actually increase the contractility of the cells. And when you overexpress the HDAC9, you get the exact opposite. There's less contraction of these collagen discs, and you're reducing the contractility of the smooth muscle cells. So at this point, nothing had been established about the role of HDAC9 in vascular smooth muscle cells. Uh, actually, what had been established in the cardiovascular system was work done by Eric Olson's lab, looking at HDAC9 in the context of cardiomyopathy and cardiac myocyte function. So we were very excited about this result because it clearly shows that HDAC9 is regulating vascular smooth muscle cell phenotype and function. And so we took it to the in vivo stage, and um, we uh, were able to um, acquire HDAC9 deficient mice from Eric Olson's laboratory. And we saw here that in the context of HDAC9 deficiency, the MGP knockout mice have significantly reduced calcification and um, uh, about 50% reduction and a dose-dependent reduction in RUNX, aortic RUNX2 mRNA levels when you go from normal HDAC9 levels to uh, heterozygotes to full um, knockouts. We also showed that by um, by having HDAC9 deficiency, the MGP mice have significantly improved survival, which is a lot for this mouse model. This mouse model is very, very severe, has a very severe phenotype. 
And I said, as I said before, uh, the mice tend to die by um, four to five weeks of age, but we were to uh, basically double their, their survival. Um, now the, uh, remember, the MGP model is a model of medial vessel calcification. We also saw reduced calcification in the atherosclerotic mouse model via, of the LDLR knockout mice. Um, now, how do HDACs work? Uh, so let me, you know, I just wanted to spend the next five or 10 minutes or so diving into the, the mechanisms and the molecular biology. So we know that histone deacetylases generally work by regulating chromatin accessibility. Um, there's this equilibrium between the acetylated state, which have negative charges that open up the chromatin because of the repulsion of the negative charges. The histone deacetylases remove those acetyl groups, thereby allowing the, the DNA to go into a more um, closed or repressed conformation. So HDACs generally inhibit or repress transcription. There are 11 known HDACs um, grouped into four different classes. Um, HDAC9 is part of the class 2A group, uh, which consists of HDAC4, 5, 7, and 9. There's not much expression of HDAC7 in the vasculature, but HDAC4, 5, and 9 are expressed to a high degree both in the vasculature and in the bone. Um, and so we were interested in seeing whether the role of HDAC9 in vascular calcification um, was specific to HDAC9, or did other class members like HDAC4 or HDAC5 also have a role? Um, so I'll get into that data in a moment. Um, but what you see here is that these, this, the specific class 2A HDACs, they, all the HDACs have this deacetylase domain in blue, but the class 2A HDACs have these long end terminal domains that regulate its function or, or have some activity. And one of the known activity uh, of these um, HDACs is that it binds to MEF2, which is a transcription factor or a family of transcription factors. And so these HDACs also inhibit MEF2 function in the nucleus. Interestingly though, there's HDAC expression not only in the nucleus, but also in the cytosol. And no one really understands what the role of these HDACs are in the cytoplasm. We have a better understanding of what it's doing in the nucleus by regulating transcription but its, uh, its role in the cytosol is, is not known. So um, the work I'm going to show now is from a, po um, a postdoc in my laboratory, Dr. Wen Di Tian. And um, again, our question was, is, was the effect on vascular calcification of, of via HDAC9 specific to HDAC9, or do other HDACs also regulate vascular calcification? And as you can see here very quickly, that um, when you knock down HDAC4 or HDAC5, you get a similar effect. You, you can inhibit vascular calcification. So it seems to be an effect of, of, of most of the class 2A members. Again, we didn't test HDAC7 because it's not expressed much in the two muscle cells. Now, at, at the same time, roughly, this paper in Nature Communications was published uh, related to bone biology, looking at the role of focal adhesion kinase um, as a regulator of HDAC4 and 5 in bone cells through phosphorylation. So, um, so we were wondering, and that, and, and by phosphorylating HDAC4 and 5, you regulate its intracellular localization. The phosphorylated states tend to <laughs> localize to the cytosol. In the dephosphorylated states, the HDAC4 and 5 tend to go to the nucleus. So we hypothesized that one, maybe focal adhesion kinase, also plays a role in vascular calcification through effects on HDAC4 and 5. And, um, and so we used this specific small molecule that inhibits focal adhesion kinase, and lo and behold, we saw that focal adhesion kinase inhibitors inhibit vascular calcification. And when you overexpress HDAC4 using the adenovirus, you get increased calcification that's inhibited or prevented by focal adhesion kinase inhibition. So this data would suggest that, yes, um, focal adhesion kinase plays a role through its effects on HDACs, uh, at least in part on affecting vascular calcification. So, um, so we, um, this is the last slide on this section, but we were, um, we were interested in, um, what we showed here is that um, these focal adhesion kinases in, in the context of calcification can reduce RUNX2 expression, can, can reduce the transition to an oxygenic phenotype by reducing alkaline phosphatase expression. And in a dose dependent manner, we tested two different compounds that inhibit focal adhesion kinase and, got, and observed dose dependent effects on uh, vascular through muscle cell calcification. What we further uh, showed was that these FAC inhibitors inhibited the phosphorylation of both HDAC4 and HDAC5 in the context of uh, calcification media. And that correlated with um, 
the DFOS4 related uh, state correlated with more HDAC4 and HDAC5 present in the nucleus compared to the untreated state that um, were present both in the nucleus and the cytosol. So I think what we're seeing in the in the uh, in the prior paper with the osteocytes was similar to what we're seeing in acute muscle cells, um, and that there's an upstream role for focal adhesion kinase regulating HDACs, which then regulate vascular acute muscle cell calcification. So that's the upstream regulation of HDACs. What about the downstream regulation of HDACs? What's downstream of HDACs that uh, then cause the sweet muscle cells to calcify? Um, so we overexpress two isoforms of HDAC called MITRE1 and MITRE2. They're, HDAC9 has 27 different isoforms. So we, we, uh, we overexpress two of the more common isoforms of HDAC9 and uh, performed um, RNA-seq on it. And in this transcriptomic analysis, many pathways were perturbed. But, but what we saw in particular were pathways related to lysosomes. Um, PIP kinase AKT, mTOR, all uh, circul and circulating the idea of uh, uh, HDAC9 potentially having an effect on autophagy. Um, and so uh, inspired by some of the prior work that Ya Bing had done in autophagy, uh, we explored the, the role of um, HDACs on autophagy in regulating vascular acute muscle cell calcification. Now, what is autophagy? Autophagy is an evolutionary conserved process where basically cells recycle toxins and intracellular components in a process of rejuvenation. It's basically the idea behind the intermittent fasting diet, right? So if you fast and starve your cells, the cells will have no choice but to turn on mechanisms known as autophagy that recycle intracellular parts and get rid of cellular toxins and so forth. It was first discovered in yeast 20 years ago and it's highly conserved throughout um, species from yeast to mammalian systems. And there are different steps of the autophagy pathway. One is the autophagy initiation. You're creating this initial membrane or phagophore within the, uh, within the cytoplasm. And that's mediated by proteins like ULK1, um, Becklin1, um, ATG13. Um, you might see here mTOR. mTOR is an inhibitor of autophagy. It's a, and it's signaling uh, about states of cell starvation. So when you inhibit mTOR, you actually act it with, with a drug like rapamycin, you can actually activate the autophagy pathway. Okay, so there's the initial uh, initiation of autophagy. This phagophore then tries to recruit the, the components within the cell that need to be recycled or broken down. This, is, uh, this occurs with the help of a protein known as LC3. LC3 is a membrane-bound protein that gets lipidated and then helps recruit um, bring in DNA and, and proteins uh, into the phagophore that need to be broken down and recycled. And then finally, the, um, this phagophore or autophagosome, once it's encapsulated, uh, fuses with the lysosome, which has a low pH and a lot of endonucleases and proteases that recycle all of the components. And, and then this autophagosome, uh, this autolysosome uh, undergoes degradation. So, um, and the lysosome has its own markers, such as the protein LAMP1. So how do we read this process of autophagy that has multiple steps and multiple different components? Well, we can look at a measure of the initiation of autophagy with the ULK1 uh, levels. We can look at the ability of the phagophore to form and uh, bring in these components that need to be recycled. That's measured by LC3D levels. And then we can look at the final step, this fusion with the phagophore um, and the lysosome um, and look at co-localization, which we can measure by looking at the co-localization of LC3D with the lysosomal marker LAMP1. So just a quick overview of a very complex uh, signaling process here, but uh, just keep in mind that these are the three uh, assessments that we used in our laboratory to assess autophagy. And, and when you look at just calcification of the sweet muscle cells, you can see that um, many of the autophagy components are downregulated, whereas the lysosomal components are upregulated. So this suggested to us that calcification is associated with reduced autophagy uh, or functional autophagy. And so um, this was further evidenced by transmission of electron microscopy, which showed that in the context of calcified sweet muscle cells, you see this intracellular buildup of vacuoles and autophagosomes and lysosomes that don't appear to be fusing appropriately. 
um, for the, the normal degradation process within our crawfish tank. So, so um, what did we do next? We used um, our different measures of autophagy. This first one is this co-localization of LC3D and LAMP1. LC3D in red, LAMP1, the lysosomal marker in green. And if they're fusing appropriately, if autophagy is fluxing appropriately, you should see a nice yellow signal, um, which combines the red and the green. And you can see that in healthy cells. But under states of calcification, you lose that fusion of the um, autophagosome with the lysosome, and, and you have disrupted autophagy flux. So we were very excited about these observations, and so you know we just did some additional tests, you know pharmacologic tests, and we saw that when you activate autophagy with rapamycin, you again see a nice reduction in calcification. But if you inhibit autophagy, and there's a, there are many pharmacologic inhibitors of autophagy, we use the one that inhibited UOK1. You can see a dose-dependent worsening of vascular calcification. So this is all in our in vitro models so far. So how does this relate to human diseases? So we took tissue samples from patients both with um, <clears throat> large vessel aortic calcification and small vessel calcification. And what we observed in, uh, in these um, in situ hybridization studies is that there's a significant reduction in the expression of UOK1 in, in both disease states, suggesting that there, there appears to be reduced autophagy within uh, the context of vascular calcification in human tissues. So then how does HDAC9 relate to autophagy? So we, again, we, what we knock down HDAC9 and we see this nice yellow signal representing intact autophagy flux and good co-localization of the LC3D and the LAMP1. But when we overexpress HDAC9, we, we see the opposite. We don't see that co-localization of that yellow signal um, and so we really believe that HDAC9 is promoting vascular calcification through this inhibition of autophagy. And I won't have time to go over all the de details here, but we think it's happening in part via recruitment of this DNA transcriptional repressor called EZH2. So it had been previously described that HDAC9 recruits EZH2 to the nucleus and, <clears throat> and regulates uh, chromatin availability of different genes or promoter activation of different genes. And so we performed ATAC-seq experiments, and this is a, a very nice tool that we use in the laboratory to look at promoter accessibility across the entire genome. And so we did a very simple cellular experiment. We took normal cells, we took calcified human smooth muscle cells, and then we took those same calcified human smooth muscle cells that overexpress HDAC9 and inhibited EZH2 with this compound known as GSK343. So, um, and what we found is that there were significant changes in promoter accessibility. First, comparing just standard healthy smooth muscle cells with calcified smooth muscle cells, what we found is that at these autophagy initiation genes, for instance, UOK1 and HG13, there was significant reduction in promoter availability in the state of calcification, suggesting less expression. It sort of matches what we saw with our Western blot data. But when we give the UOK1 inhibitor, we reverse that back to the normal phenotype, and we can see more open chromatin states at both of these promoter regions. So we think that HDAC9 is recruiting EZH2, regulating the promoter availability at these, um, these autophagy initiation genes, and, and the genes important for autophagy, and thereby regulates the downstream development of vascular smooth muscle cell calcification. We furthermore took this to both the in vitro and in vivo level. When we give this EZH2 inhibitor, to our smooth muscle cells, we can inhibit calcification, and we can also improve the survival of our mice uh, pharmacologically with this GSK uh, inhibitor, as well as um, histologically uh, based on calcification. We also used another mouse model of autophagy activation or hyperactivation with this hyperactivating mutation in Becklin-1, and we saw the same thing, that when you activate um, autophagy genetically, you improve the survival of the MGT knockout mice and also reduce the calcification of the aorta. So in summary, polymorphisms in the HDAC9 locus, as well as the RAP1 gap locus, are associated with aortic calcification at the genome-wide level of significance. Inhibition of HDAC9 activity specifically and expression prevented calcification of the smooth muscle cells and favored a contractile phenotype. And in the in vivo state, when we knocked out HDAC9 in mice, 
This was predictive both against medial and intimal vascular calcification and atherosclerosis. We were interested in the, in the mechanisms, and so we studied both the upstream and downstream targets of HDACs. We think that propylate DJ kinase is an important regulator of HDACs upstream, and that autophagy is the primary driver of HDAC-mediated vascular tube muscle cell calcification. Um, so this is four to five years of work that I'm just summarizing in just these two slides, but it really took a concept that emanated from a human genetic study that we were able to take to the lab, identify the molecular mechanisms, and show relevance in an in vivo model. Um, so I, I have, uh, I'll quickly just tell you that the world, you know, interestingly, when you look at, um, this is the next story that I'm just going to talk about briefly on sulfatases, but interestingly, um, there's a lot more that can be improved upon when you're looking at these genome-wide association studies. The one that I just showed you that was published um, four or five years ago now, um, again, was limited in the fact that there it was only a discovery cohort of Caucasian individuals um, based on not whole genome sequencing, but using these microarrays of uh, common polymorphisms in the, in the genome that had been established at the time. Since then, the, the ability to perform these GWASs has been refined. Now there's statistical tools to combine all of the different ethnicities into one and to adjust for ethnic, different ethnicities. We also have the ability to do um, whole genome sequencing in a high throughput way so that we um, um, can analyze all the regions of the chromosome, not just selected polymorphisms um, that require imputation. Furthermore, most of the prior GWASs, because of this limitation in the sequencing, ignored the X chromosome. But whole genome sequence, uh, and the, re the reason why the X chromosome was ignored is because you didn't know what, if what you were getting was on the X chromosome or if it was on an autologous uh, section of the Y chromosome or whether that part of the X chromosome was X inactivated or served as an autosome. So there's lots of complexity of the X chromosome that can be circumvented when you do whole genome sequencing. So that's exactly what we did. We performed whole genome sequencing on a cohort of 22,400 individuals from nine different studies. And this included five different ethnicities um, you know, as listed here, of which 50%, all of them had undergone coronary CT imaging. So we had their quantified coronary uh, calcium score of which 50% of the population that we were studying had some detectable coronary calcium. The mean age was about 58, and it was approximately half and half uh, female versus male. And so this enabled us to study new polymorphism, or identify new gene polymorphisms associated with coronary calcium. Up till now, there had been four loci that had been identified, and in our GWAS, we replicated all four of those loci, but we identified two new loci, MMP16 and aryl sulfate. An interesting thing about aryl sulfatase E is that it's on the X chromosome. It's the first genetic excellent genetic association with coronary disease, um, as well as coronary calcification. And when we performed our expression analyses uh, in human tissues, we found that these variants that are associated with coronary calcification are associated with higher expression levels of aryl sulfatase E. So this work was just published, and I won't have time to go through it all. But I just wanted to highlight what the sulfatases are. But the sulfatases are an interesting um, uh, family of enzymes. There are 17 members uh, of this family. And um, cells uh, will secrete or synthesize sort of this three-dimensional structure that surrounds the cells, like glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, heparin sulfates, which regulate the ability of uh, cellular extracellular ligands to bind to the surface. So these are really important regulators of cellular signaling, these glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. And what you can see here is that the sulfatases are a group of enzymes that desulfate these um, proteoglycans. Um, uh, and by removing that negative charge, enables negatively charged ligands to come um, more and bind to the cell surface. So, um, so there are 17 of them, and uh, we were excited to find out that aryl sulfatase E, which we had identified to be associated with coronary calcification, there are mutations known in humans that cause something known as X-linked chondrodysplasia, abnormality in calcification of the cartilage. So it makes sense that something involved in cartilage disease also uh, affects vascular calcification. So um, 
So work led by Kuldeep Singh that was just recently published really developed the mechanisms of this, which I won't have time for uh, to review, but um, I think I'll um, just skip ahead. I sort of knew that this was going to happen, but we sort of developed the mechanisms of this uh, self-paced pathway and how it works. Um, but I refer you to the paper that was just published. Um, so there's a lot left to be discovered in vascular calcification and its mechanisms. And um, so we continue to refine our ability to identify these novel targets with human genetic studies. And so in this paper that we recently published, um, we led the largest GWAS to date for coronary artery calcification. And again, you know, we, we replicate old findings, but we identify new findings. And so we've identified four new targets that regulate calcification. One of them is already known from a Mendel disorder uh, that uh, causes vascular calcification in kids called EMPP1. But we've identified three new genes, IGFTP3, ARI5B, and ABK, all of which will fuel future investigations into their role in vascular calcification. So we've done some of that functional work already, which I won't go over. But the interesting thing about this is that now in the omics or bioinformatics space, we have the ability to predict what drugs are regulating what genes, at least at the expression level. And these types of analyses lends itself to identifying potential new therapies for uh, diseases that you're trying to target. And so we've done that drug ability analysis and I've identified drugs like ascorbic acid that might target ARID5B, um, dabigatran, which is an anticoagulant that might target ABK, uh, this antibody that can target FTF23. So again, this GWAS combined with drug ability analysis can lend itself to identify new uh, therapies for vascular disease and we're actively testing some of these drugs in the laboratory for at least an in vitro role in vascular calcification. In the last few minutes, and I have three minutes uh, before we want to go to questions, I want to bring up a clinical um, uh, translational aspect of the research that we've been doing in the laboratory, and that's for this disease known as calciphylaxis. So it's a severe form of accelerated vascular calcification. <clears throat> it presents as these subcutaneous nodules that can ulcerate and clearly extend, usually um, on the extremities, either the arms or the legs. Unfortunately, it's, um, ulcers, um, ulcerated lesions can become super infected and lead to sepsis, which can be fatal for the patient. And what we see at the histologic level is that the small arterioles of the dermis become diffusely calcified. Um, so this is the von Koste staining of this uh, from this one patient, showing that there's a tremendous amount of calcification here. Um, and this calcification results in occlusion of the small arterioles with thrombosis, and that's what leads to these ulcerated necrotic um, lesions. Calciphylaxis unfortunately affects one to two percent of patients on hemodialysis, and we have about a million patients on hemodialysis currently in the United States. So at any given time, there's about 10 to 20,000 individuals uh, who have calciphylaxis. The mortality is 50 to 80 percent within one year of diagnosis, and there is no approved therapies. So it's virtually a death sentence um, uh, when someone develops calciphylaxis. So. Um, there have been published uh, a lot of known risk factors for the development of calciphylaxis in addition to kidney disease, but one of them that's the strongest is warfarin. So this brings us back to the beginning of the talk where warfarin, as, as I highlighted, inhibits <coughs> MGP because of this inability to cycle vitamin K. And so, um, so we hypothesize that <coughs> if, if, if MGP is important for inhibiting calcification in calciphylaxis, or there's some perturbation of MGP, we would expect to see the downstream consequences. Now remember, MGP inhibits BMP signaling. So we, our first hypothesis is, well, is BMP signaling increased in calciphylaxis? So we took histologic specimens from patients with calciphylaxis as well as control patients. This is the, this is the uh, case of calciphylaxis. And stained for a marker of BMP signaling, namely phosphosphat 1,5. And you can see that there's a tremendous amount of uh, BMP signaling or phosphosphat signaling here in the nuclei of a vessel that's calcified. Furthermore, what we identified is that in, this, in, in calciphylaxis patients, not all the vessels have calcified, although they're, they're progressing towards it. It takes, instead of decades, it takes weeks to months for these vessels to develop calcification. 
But what we observed in this one histologic specimen is that in a vessel that had not yet calcified, there was a, a large amount of BMT signaling here. But in all of our control patients, and these control patients all had kidney disease, uh, and they were well matched for age, sex, diabetes status, there was very little signal for BMT signaling. We thought, okay, so histologically, it seems like BMP signaling is upregulated in the context of calciphylaxis, and that BMP signaling <laughs> seems to be upregulated even before calcification develops in some of the vessels. If that's the case, then, then MGP shouldn't occur or should, be, uh, should not be present as much. And, and there should be less activated MGP because MGP inhibits BMP signaling. And so that's exactly what we observed. We, um, we didn't do it at the tissue level, but in circul you know, we measured circulating both carboxylated and uncarboxylated MGP levels. And those calciphylaxis patients had significantly reduced amounts of active carboxylated MGP compared to the controls. And if that's the case, then we wondered, okay, well, maybe vitamin K, since we know vitamin K is what's regulating or activating MGP, maybe calciphylaxis is a disease of vitamin K deficiency. Um, because vitamin K is required to activate the MGP. And so we measured vitamin K levels, and it turns out 90% of calciphylaxis patients have had vitamin K deficiency mm -hmm. in our cohort, whereas under 40% um, had it in the controls. So certainly that makes sense why warfarin would be a risk factor since it affects vitamin K uh, cycling in the body. So we took it to the next level and we said, okay, well, we hypothesized that this axis of vitamin K, MGP, BMP is an important therapeutic target for vascular calcification. So we actually performed a clinical trial. And we enrolled, in the end, we enrolled 26 patients. 13 were uh, assigned to the vitamin K group and 13 were assigned to placebo. So of course, very small sample sizes. But fortunately, this is a rare disease. Uh, but, you know, it makes it hard to run a clinical trial in these patients since it is a rare disease. But, um, but we, we were able to um, uh, study 26 patients, and these were the results. So the common clinical surrogates for these patients is lesion size and area, number of lesions, pain intensity, and that's exactly what we looked at. And what we found is that in the vitamin K group, we saw an actual reduction in the pain intensity and a lack of progression of the, of the surface area. In the placebo group, there was a a significant progression over this 12-week study in the, um, in the surface area of the lesions, but the vitamin K group had no progression or even a reduction in the surface area of the lesions. And we weren't empowered to look at mortality, but no deaths occurred in the vitamin K arm um, over the course of the study, whereas four deaths occurred in the placebo arm, which did lead to statistical significance. So we're very excited about this. Of course, this is just preliminary data. <clears throat> we need a much larger study. But we think that calciphylaxis represents a, you know, we know it's an accelerated form of vascular calcification. We think it represents abnormal, abnormally elevated BMP signaling, reduced MGP activation. Excuse me. And, and, um, and so um, certainly warfarin should be avoided in patients with end-stage renal disease because of this risk of developing calciphylaxis. And the large-scale clinical trial for vitamin K uh, for this patient population is um, currently underway. So I'll end there, um, but it was a nice sort of clinical uh, application of some of the basic biology we have been studying in the laboratory. I want to thank um, all of the past and current members of my laboratory who, who created all this data. I'm just one presenting it. All of my prior mentors and collaborators and I certainly want to uh, give a special thanks to Yabing for all of her mentorship over the years. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. I'm excited to see the line of data. Uh, question. Yeah, thank you for amazing talk. I had a question from the MGP from the beginning. I'm glad you're talking about that at the end. <laughs> Uh, so the, it, it very depends on the warfarin as well as vitamin K. Uh, is that pharmacogenetics that affects this uh, metabolism, like the 69 or BCO? Oh, that's, that that's a great question. So, affect that? so there have been, so the genetic um, polymorphisms that affect the metabolism of vitamin K have been associated at the singular level with uh, vascular calcification. And, what needs to be done is a polygenic risk score, which is something that our lab is actively working on. A polygenic risk score of vitamin K metabolism to see its, its uh, 
to see if its role in predicting future vascular health. <clears throat> so great question. Great, great story. Thanks. Four is actually. <laughs> so um, I have many questions, but I'll just have to do. Uh, the first question is to do with the, does the vascular calcification can be compared to the regional almost abnormalities between SEME and non SEME patients? So are they? With vascular calcification and uh, SEME the, versus non SEME? The wall motion of abnormalities, the ventricular wall motion of that, actually, that's an interesting question. Um, we have not, nothing been correlated, but why, why, what, what would you hypothesize, or I guess what because you your saying? mouse model is clearly showing that there is the calcification and the ventricular fibrosis. Well, that so that those are two different models. So, so the uh, one is a homozygote knockout model that develops vascular calcification. The, the one with the ventricular abnormalities is the one that's MGP heterozygosity that doesn't develop calcification but develops arterial stiffness. So it's the arterial stiffness that leads to the um, increased ventricular fibrosis and hyperplastic physiology. And then the second question is to do with the FDL dysfunctional FDL because we always go for the LDL FDL ratio and stuff like that. And oxidation is not restricted to LDL or SMN FDL as well. So how do you compare the inflammatory FDL or dysfunctional FDL contributing to the contributing to the vascular? 